Hi, my name is Solomon Yeo, and I'm the campaign director of the Pacific Island Students Fighting Climate Change. There are many climate change, many adverse effects of climate change that is occurring in the Pacific. Many of them often overlap with um, a lot of other existing social uh, issues. But uh, just to name, uh, just to share uh, share with you uh, a story from the Solomon Islands, where I'm from. Um, so, um, in the period of 1993 to 2010, um, it, the estimated rise of annual sea level rise has been around um, eight to ten millimeter uh, annually. So together, this has made storm surges. Uh, becoming more, um, uh, in addition to sea level rise, rising of sea, storm surges have been more violent and are very destructive, as well as uh, effective in terms of the 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 goal on washing away shorelines or breaking uh, breaking the barriers that are set up to resist and mitigate the adaptation projects, uh, ad adapting to that issue of climate change. Um, and also, we have seen the, the rising of ocean acidification and uh, coral bleaching. Um, this has really declined the health of our reefs that act as a very natural barriers to mitigate these impacts. So when my team and I are doing our field work uh, out in the outer islands, where these are some areas that I used to grow up in, um, I noticed there are some considerable change in the environment. I have noticed little small islets, small islands have really shrunken in size. And you can, you see in the water, you see the coral and the reefs uh, appearing more white and pale, which of course would mean it's, it's coral bleach, they're bleached. Um, graves that were along coastlines were now submerged underwater, or you can see they're being washing or washed away. And coconut trees are either slanted or have uh, are dying or just falling apart and dying um, because of um, the, the 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 soil erosion uh, soil erosion from the washing of the seas um, coming in in inland. Um, we have water sources such as uh, wells, makeshift pipes. Uh, they are either contaminated with salts during high uh, high tides. Uh, and at, at this time of, of that day, water is really at your knee level, where you can see grandmothers and mothers uh, cannot really perform their day-to-day -day activities. Uh, also, in addition to um, collecting waters, they cannot light any fires in their kitchen uh, as their, the kitchen floor is flooded with, with the sea. So studying the adverse effects of climate change and the slow progress at the international level is concerning enough. But uh, and frustrating as well, but witnessing it, how it actually transforms the environment and how it undermines the basic human rights of your people, uh, especially those who never owned a vehicle or flew an airplane in their life. You just feel this cocktail of emotions like pain, anger, and sorrow. You really feel injustice that is being, injustice is taking place on your people. And even worse, the IPCC report uh, on 1.5 degree highlighted at that, uh, even at um, at one point five degree target, which is the global compromise, we will see the uh, seven up to seventy to ninety percent of the coral reef uh, dying out. And without this coral reef, of course, you can see uh, exaggerated uh, sea level rise and unprecedented waves waves driven flooding will take place, and really continues to accelerate the erosion of our uh, shorelines saltwater intrusion, and even worst case scenarios, uh, climate displacement. Our organization have two main objectives. One primarily is to request a CK United Nations General Assembly resolution to request an advisory opinion from the International Court of Justice. This was the founding initiative that led to the formation of the organization. Um, uh, Pacific, of course, has been all, always at the forefront of climate leadership uh, in the United Nations Framework Convention for Climate Change uh, for obvious reasons um, for almost three decades now. And yet our voices have been still not been heard. Our demands have not been heard. Um, therefore, what the, what the students did uh, back in 2019 was really to urge the government 
to consider in addition to the negotiation to consult other tools that would potentially help to catalyze the progress. And these other tools from our side of as law students were tools that were available in law that we can utilize to accelerate the progress. And because, of course, the wall is now on the brink of uh, the tipping point, we're closing on the tipping point, where beyond that, there will be irreversible and re irreparable global chaos taking place, not just in the Pacific, but all throughout the world. It, it is in this in this understanding, it is therefore only logical that is imperative that there must be absolute clarity, no room for excuse, no room of doubt of the obligation and our accountability for those who are most responsible to lead the transformational changes, the radical changes that we need um, to shift and bring about um, um, government's efforts to address climate change more aggressively to it so that we can meet these targets. And of course, my, uh, uh, from from law from a law student perspective, at that time, the rule of law must really not be a bystander to the climate crisis. It it should lend its powerful voice in ensuring the government uh, more accountable and more ambitious in a, in their efforts to protect and address uh, the needs of their citizens while stabilizing the global planet. And our other objective is really to educate and activate other Pacific youth to really take action because the problem of climate change is, is a long-term struggle. Hence, as for Pacific Islanders, advocacy must be sustainable. I am, what, 20, 27 right now? I won't be, uh, in a few years' time, I'll no longer be a youth and I'll be working in different areas. Uh, our elders are becoming um, old now and they will eventually leave the, the line of advocacy. So we continue need to, uh, the young people of today must carry on the responsibility uh, for our Pacific advocacy. And our role precisely is therefore to share our learnings for what we learn about climate change with them and to really engage them in activities, uh, whether it's beach cleanups, tree planting, building a nursery, to even attending a uh, conference of parties and other regional and international conferences, conferences to keep the momentum alive. Uh, and in doing so, we are uh, either passing, passing on the torch and or fanning the flames for uh, Pacific advocacy and activism. Pretty straightforward. Um, although there, are, of course, again, there's a lot of <laughs> uh, ways that it's impact uh, people in the Pacific, but um, because of increased rainfall, irregular and infrequent rainfall, it has created a lot of catchments. Um, and this has become a concern for vector-borne diseases like uh, dengue and malaria. It, it really creates a ground that they can really proliferate. And also the warming of the ocean sea surface temperature has really expanded these grounds for breeding, for breeding blood-feeding anthropods to even climb higher uh, to catchments in high-altitude areas, which would mean uh, new access to populations that are living further inland, thereby increasing the contact with that population would re means more diseases. Uh, people will be affected by these diseases. Um, and in the Pacific, one of the leading cases of, um, I, I would say one of the main leading cases of death is non-communicable non uh, diseases or NCDs. And because it's, of course, high influx of imported of high glucose and sodium processed food, it's starting to, well, it's already displacing a lot of um, uh, nutritious, healthy island diets, such as vegetables, root crops, and seafood. Um, although climate change is not the dominant factor that plays a uh, dominant factor, but it really plays a contributory role where seafood now is becoming scarce, scarcer, scarcer and more expensive um, due to overfishing and declining ocean health. Uh, as highlighted, coral bleaching and ocean acidifications. Farms and gardens uh, become more unreliable as a food source, as heavy rains continue to decimate these local farm cyclones, um, destroy all of these farms that have been growing for, what, four months, um, and water supply has been contaminated. So while we wait for the recovery for vegetables and water to be, you know, returning back to the normal sense, we need a substitute, and that substitute would be processed food. So that, in that sense, it leads to higher cases of NDCs. In the Pacific. It contributes to uh, NC, NC, NCDs rise. And you might, a person from a developed country might say, okay, so why not, why not pay for vitamins 
or immune resistance medicines as supplements. But these are, of course, available in the Pacific, but they are, uh, they are, they are considered as a luxury because only few can afford them. So this cross-cutting nature of climate crisis is becoming more like a multiplier effect as well. It worsens poverty, socioeconomic development for our region, and making it really, really difficult for our governments to respond adequately to the needs um, needs of the health systems to tackle better uh, the health concerns around the country, thereby leading to health a health crisis. So I can easily argue that the climate crisis is a health crisis. So speaking in the context of the ICJO initiative, um, the question that is contained in the resolution, it seeks to really uh, request the ICJ to clarify the obligations to states between each other um, and with regards to protecting the climate Earth's, uh, the Earth's uh, climate systems as well as other parts of the environment. And, um, um, and if they fail, if they fail to protect it, what are the consequences that for failing to meeting those obligations? Um, that is why we're seeking to clarify it before the ICJ. So the past, present, and future harmful activities, uh, as we know, um, are primarily caused by uh, these larger, larger nations. And they have played a very dominant role uh, in the neg uh, negative interference of the climate system, as well as the degradation of the environment. Um, and as a result, we have seen a widespread uh, but disproportionate, disproportionate effect of uh, climate change, really undermining the human rights of people everywhere. As I've given some examples above, basic human rights, access to water, access to food, health, they're all undermined. And larger nations, therefore, have a massive obligation to cooperate with other nations to ensure that emissions are checked and they are in line to meet with the 1.5 degree target and as well as providing financial mitigation and adaptation needs uh, towards developing countries um, um, and to really promote rights-based uh, uh, rights based approaches in cl addressing climate change as, uh, as highlighted human rights concerns are uh, becoming worsening and intensifying across the world as the climate crisis in intensifies. So that's in my, in my argument, I would say that. Yeah, it's a good question. Um, the advisory opinion campaign has uh, three phases. First is to, to request it, uh, seeking it, uh, getting it passed through the United Nations General Assembly. The second phase is to get a, a court to rule a decision on advisory opinion. And the third phase is to uh, implement the advisory opinion, utilize the uh, advisory opinion to, to influence um, uh, the glo uh, global climate change regime as well as uh, society as a, as a whole. So the hardest part with all of these three phases is actually seeking the advisory opinion uh, through the United Nations General Assembly, getting it passed the United Nations General Assembly. So now that has been passed. Uh, we now enter the phase two, which is to us is the most important part of this whole process, uh, which is the court proceedings. So according to the rule of the, uh, the, the statute of the court, uh, it only states and intergovernmental organizations are permitted to participate before the ICJ proceedings. And these are written submissions and oral submissions. But all, um, all submissions in doing so, we think that it's very necessary to include not only governments, but also the voices of uh, civil society, uh, grassroots communities, um, uh, indigenous people, and more importantly, the voices of youth as we will be the ones uh, facing most uh, um, of the climate crisis now and in the future. So we really, uh, the work still is needed to ensure that governments are well aware of what the youth voices are. That is what uh, young, young people in the Pacific as well as elsewhere around the world are now working together to ensure that their voices are um, included into the, in those, in the, in the second phase. And we really, at this moment, we will be doing a lot of work to encourage government, especially climate vulnerable governments, to really participate in the ICGO proceedings as it's a grave matter of concern that they should. Looking back, in the, looking back into uh, the, the history, you can see that um, uh, states largely, de developing country states, have been hesitant to participate before the court. 
Um, so this is a moment that we would really want to encourage as many as possible states to participate before the court and ensuring that the, the voices of young people and, um, and those people who have not been heard and their testimony, testimonies are being placed front and center to the court. And the second part of your question really reminds me of um, uh, the UN Secretary General Antonio Gutierrez. He made a speech at COP27 where he stated that we are really, uh, we are really on the highway to climate climate hell with our foot still on the accelerator and the warm has already been the world has already been warmed at 1.5 degrees and the pacific as well as many vulnerable countries uh, everywhere only have 3. Uh, 0.3 degrees remaining before they reach the 1.5 degree target which not only allows us uh, which only allows us to survive but not to thrive and um we only have, only have one decade to turn this all around um, I am very hopeful because if, if the world can really do it with COVID, with the COVID pandemic responses, then we can do it for climate change as well. And for Pacific Islands, we, we must always remain hopeful because without it, we forfeit our right to exist.